Welcome back, Rebels. Ho, ho, ho. Oh, it's Merry Bloody Christmas, isn't it? It's nearly time for the holidays. Okay. Do you know what? It really annoys me, actually, when uh, podcasts go all really Christmassy, because I'll be listening to it in July. I'll be like, why are you banging on about Christmas? Yeah. I think the majority of podcasts are not listened to when they come out. Or do you think I'm wrong? I don't know. Well, I suppose it depends on how avid a listener you are to that podcast. I know like, well, you've, actually, I suppose if you think of the averages, if I go and find a new podcast and I'm scrolling down episodes to listen to, I'm never going to listen to the one that's just come out. I'm going to search for and maybe find a guest that I'm into or something or yeah. a topic that I'm interested in rather than just whatever the latest one is. Yeah, I suppose so. Well, having said that, we're going to bombard people with a load of Christmas content over the next couple of weeks. So Yeah, it'll be Christmas content, but I think it's not going to be about Santa, Christmas trees and elves and stuff. It's going to be motivational, practical advice. So happy July. Yeah, happy July to anyone who's currently sat on the beach somewhere listening to this. And Merry Christmas to anyone who's listened to this when it's actually released. If you choose to celebrate that time of year. So if you're an artistic creative type, how do you find your style? Good question. I think the best thing to do to start with anyway is to just learn and copy. So I felt like whenever I start taking anything up, I look for loads of people I find inspirational, copy them for ages (laughs) until I get to a stage when I feel like I can achieve the level that they are. Because I feel like the best way to learn for me is to look at something and think, how can I do that? So I'll look at an image, uh, look at a painting, look at like something that inspires me and think like, well, how can I achieve that? And then by trial and error and from watching tutorials, you start to pick up these different things that you never would have found out if you were just going at it from your own imagination. I think the idea of just going at things with an imagination is very, very hard when you first start. It sounds like this idealistic way of you just sit down, these great thoughts and vi- images will come to you and you can just create them. But it doesn't really work like that. No, nothing happens in a vacuum, does it? I think as well, when you're a creative and you're trying to create something, that sometimes you might have this imag- like you might have this vision and I want to create this, but you don't have the talent or you don't know how to do it, which is really hard when you're first starting. So I think like to start with, it's really great to copy people because you can learn the skills and learn the abilities you need to be able to create anything. So it's now, for example, like with Photoshop or with like photos or anything, I can look at an image that someone else has created and I could already break down how that's created in my head. And that allows me so much kind of versatility because it's like I can see something that's on a painting or something else that's kind of non-photography related and think oh how could I do that in Photoshop with the skills and tools that I have but so I think like once you've got the skill set I think that's what you need to do first and then finding a style comes later and I would say you find a style by trying lots and lots and lots of different things and just finding out what works for you. So yes we are advocating plagiarism um but if you do copy people like i mean i learned so much from when i was a young graffiti artist copying old legends like going through subway art and copying the outlines and things like that and you learn so much just in the process i think the danger is then to have a style that is so closely based on someone else that it does just become plagiarism and if you sort of become lazy like you've learned how they do it but then you don't add your own experimentation. I think what a lot of people do is they'll see creatives who've been really successful and think, well, for me to be successful, I need to mimic exactly what they've done. So I see it a lot with on Instagram, especially where you get photographers who copy people like Brandon Woeful. Shout out to Brandon, former guest on the show. There's like a genre now built around Brandon Woeful style photographs. Yeah, and you just see it and you know there's nothing original there. It's You can basically just, if you see that image, you could probably scroll down Brandon's feed and find something exactly the same and yeah whole genre has come from that because of because he's got successful on it and and but the interesting thing is when you follow brandon as we both do you see him then continue to develop his style which you don't then see from the imitators because he's still pushing himself out of his comfort zone and and trying new things whereas the people who are just imitating the style are not Yeah, and I feel like if you're one of the people who are just imitating that, you're never going to be known for anything. No one's going to, like, there's photographers that I follow who, like, I'll get a notification saying they've posted, it'll come up and I'll see the image and I'll know who that is before I've even seen a name because you can just tell by the style. Whereas there's this huge array of, like, Instagram photographers who will post stuff and I'm like, well, that could be one of a million people because it's not Brandon because I can tell it's not Brandon. 
but I can't tell of who it is from the sea of the rest of them. But then again, that's fine because if they're all learning and not saying it's their own kind of work, then they're still on the journey and they want to share that with other people. So I think that's fair enough. I think it's defining your style later, which is where it gets important. Yeah, I suppose we, I mean, we talk a lot about patience and that comes into it again is if you haven't found, because I think people get frustrated when they haven't found their style and it doesn't just come to you in a dream. You, you do have to work at it and it is a journey. And by putting yourself into awkward situations and trying new things, you will, you will bring something to your practice from trying something that's completely out of your comfort zone. Yeah. So I think trying things that are outside your comfort zone is really important because the broader array of skills and talents and interest you can get that's the only way you're going to develop a style if you just keep consuming the same content all the time your style is just going to be an exact mimic of that because it's there's nothing else to take it from whereas if you're looking at loads of different people from all over the place you can start to take these different elements like what i've done for example is i started getting into beauty photography not because i had an interest in it but i was like well this is something that completely pushes me out of my comfort zone the level of like skill and editing and lighting and all these different things i've never done before was like scary and like really intimidating. So I thought, well, I'm going to do that. And then when I went back to doing street photography, I could use some of the elements I got from the beauty photography. And you get this kind of style that you don't really see in street photography normally because it's got a bit of a beauty element to it. So like taking things from different places and adding them together, I feel like that's where you forge your style, like finding a few different elements and making all of that into one. I mean, this podcast, I mean, we we both consume a huge ton of podcasts ourselves. We have been influenced by various different presenters over, over the years. Yeah. And we've taken the bits that we like. We've taken our own personalities and we've brought it to the table and just mashed everything together. I think what you said there about bringing our personalities is really, really important because I think that's the difference that everyone has. It's like, that's what makes you unique, your personality. So if you can bring your personality, your humor, your wit or something to whatever kind of art form you're doing, that's what makes it you. That's what makes it memorable. And I think if you can get people to like you for you as well as your art form, that's when things can really, really work well. And one person who's kind of managed to bring their personality and their craft together so perfectly is today's guest, Alex Mayhews. Alex's work is typically either beautifully crafted signs in a Victorian style or beautifully crafted signs created in a Matt Groening Simpsons style. Alex became interested in typography while at university and then after she graduated, she followed that interest and sought out an apprenticeship with a well-known sign painter. After working in the various different styles of sign painting, Alex really fell in love with working with gold leaf and working on mirrored surfaces. And that's how she's really niched down and established her way of working. In this episode, we talk about Instagram, artist studio spaces, and making work you're excited about. Your passion and interest is so um, easily observed if it's genuine in your work. People be like, oh, that person's really excited about that. And then they in turn are excited and want to employ you and then buy into it. Hi Alex. Hi, good morning. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for doing our podcast. So great to be here and see the office for the very first time. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a dick. <laughs> so this is the second time that we are um, recording this because we because uh, we fucked up your first yeah, one. Due to a technical yes. error. Technical yes. error, yeah. Yes. But Happens was... to the best of us. Like you mentioned today when we when we first saw you this morning, how um, Adam Buxton announced on his podcast that he'd done it. So I don't feel so bad about doing it. No. Yeah. Puts us in the realm of Adam Buxton now. Yeah. Adam, if you're listening, we'd love to get you on the show. Yeah. <laughs> please come on. We promise to record. <laughs> if anyone knows Adam Buxton, please forward us <laughs> on to him. Yeah. Can I come too? I like him. <laughs> so apropos of nothing, you like The Simpsons a lot, don't you? Uh, I love it. Yeah, it's great. Live, live for it. Why? Um... Because it's oh, this intense early morning question. If that's just, if that's <laughs> freaking you out, that's the it's most hard. intense question. Do you like The Simpsons? <laughs> no, it's yeah, why. It's oh. different. Fair if enough, it was do you like Simpsons, I'd be like, yes. Um, I guess it's uh, just very entertaining and enduring and well written and very funny. Hmm, I agree. Uh, I, I concur. Uh, I guess that's it. Yeah, I don't know. Also, so many people like it, so there's like you could everybody gets it, and that's a real like community thing. So like you can just like throw a weird one line out there, and then someone will be like, oh yeah, yeah. It's like a like I don't know, friends or something. Nice breaker. It's almost yeah. Like it's almost like when a, like 
you're at a party or if you're a guy anyway and you don't know anyone you just talk about football and how you got there I mean maybe you do but I (laughs) (laughs) I mean maybe uh yeah I think it's that kind of thing definitely if I like have made a sign for someone and it's got Simpsons on it and like I'm meeting them then uh I'll give them their sign and then we'll just talk about The Simpsons for 20 minutes or something like that. Yeah. And you're like, oh yeah, it's like this time and this happened or whatever. Yeah, it's good. Love Do you it. think that early in your career it kind of helped you get on people's radars? Um, yeah, definitely some people um, because I kind of made the first one as sort of like a joke or whatever. What was the first one? It was a Bart Simpson and I was like obviously learning to use gold leaf and stuff like that and I was like trying to think of things that I could paint and then I was doing like a lot of lettering but then I thought like oh that would be funny because their skin is yellow and gold and um, I did it and I put it up and then someone wanted it straight away and so I did that and then um, yeah just started doing more of them I guess uh, and then I took part in a show, uh, art show in Liverpool called No Homers Club and it was basically t- like a, just a big Simpsons exhibition and they had like, um, uh, they made like a Moe's tavern or bar in the garden there was a guy dressed up as Mo, and he was really surly, it was like, and you could ring, there was, he was handing out business cards and they had a phone number on and you could ring him up and prank call him there, <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. it was really really good. Um, and so I did that and then um, it was like really successful and there was loads of other amazing stuff there but so lots of people I made more Simpsons stuff for that and then lots of people saw that and then from that I think that definitely helped what percentage of your fans do you think are just hardcore Simpson fans I don't know and I would like love if Instagram could make a thing where people could like just pick a side because I like do a poll on your story like I've done that in the past of like just wanting to know who your audience are yeah yeah because obviously you get the demographics of like male female age location ASL for everyone who <laughs> uses um, MSN. Um, but yeah, I used to put a poll in there. I was just like, what do you do? Like, are you a photographer? Are you a model? Are you a videographer? Are you other? Yeah. And like, because those are the only jobs I recognize. Are like, you just other? <laughs> but like, because you kind of, you'll have an idea of, like, yeah. I was just like, I had an idea of who they were, but I just wanted to kind of get more of a breakdown. And then I actually got, like, I think it's like 50% photographers, 25% models, 10% videographers, and like ten percent other, so most people were. It was a lot higher than I assumed it would be. Yeah. But then it kind of allows you to realise, okay, well, this is who my audience are. What content can I create for them, and what would they find interesting? Yes, I think that is like a really good way of doing it. But then I think I know, like, say half of them are there for The Simpsons, and then half of them are there for sign painting, mm. and like, and then there's like the Venn diagram of the people who like love my Simpsons paintings. But then I, like. My Instagram is just like a mess of everything I like or something I made or something I saw that was cool. Uh, and I sometimes I worry if I'm posting too much Simpsons stuff and then so I'll post loads of signs and then I'm like, oh no, but then the Simpsons people will be bored. And I just have this like horrible, I th- what I th- do you want? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but I, th- I think if it's working for you, like there's a lot to be said. So Adam's super like analytical and he wants to know percentages. He wants to know numbers. But his, his thing is really professional. And like, I think that probably is a way that you like, because you do have tons of followers and then that's how you like grow your thing, your craft, your business, whatever it is. If you kind of pick a lane. Yeah. But I'm just but if all it over is, the road. <laughs> but it is working for you. Like, yeah, that's and because you, you have a lane. It's like... You're not just a, a sign writer. <laughs> You're not just a Simpson obsessed human. Yeah. It's a it's a mix of the two. And I think that's what makes you unique and different. Whereas it's like if you looked at other sign pages page pages, there's less personality in there. Mm-hmm. Whereas like you go on your page and you feel like you get to know you a bit more instead of just being this faceless like creative, yeah. there's a level of personality in there, which I think oh, is thank you. what works really well. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have 666 people that you follow on purpose no that is a complete coincidence <laughs> but I noticed that the other day are you keeping it that way I kind of think it's quite cool I think the average is like really really like 750 for like most people who are just like no matter how many followers you have like genuine people that you follow is like yeah. probably mm-hmm. around that amount and like sometimes I try and get it down but I just I yeah, think it's, that's it's it. hard to call isn't it when you look through really like, hard yeah. but then also you want you're curating the blog that you look at every day and so like are you going to fill it with stuff that you find interesting and inspiring or is it just going to be like stupid memes yeah (laughs) but I have done over like the past like four years or something probably around once a year it's not like I I plan to do it Mm. but have a just a mass cull of like basically just remove everyone because loads of people do also fall off because they don't like I'll go be like oh this person I forgot about them they haven't posted and then you look and they haven't posted for two years and you're like they clearly don't yeah they're not interested in 
And it's like, if I really like you, I'll remember and then I'll go and search for and it and then refollow it. Yeah. Uh, or like, it's so brutal. You literally just unfollow everyone. But how's it brutal? It's like, I... I, I, you I think up, you need to not... Sometimes I think like, oh my God, is it bad if I unfollow this person? Also, you can just mute people now. But then I'm just like, yeah. what's the point? Yeah, I, I, I think it's just a bit harsh because like they they love you and follow you. And you're just like, yeah, you don't matter to me. Unfollow. But like from, So emotionless. But, you just you don't even look. You just get rid of everyone. I think that comes down to like... It's, it's like clutter. It's like you over... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. sorry. I'm not sure you're that. making it better. But um, it's like over time, you just you're like, oh, that's a bit interesting. I'm a bit interested in that now. Like I've gone to this restaurant and I followed them, and I'm yeah, not you even kind in of fall out. Anymore. Like yeah, like maybe I will follow loads of um, design things because I'm like looking for yeah, like a new lamp in my house or whatever, and I'll follow loads of things and then be like, well, I bought the lamp. It's like Amazon being like, you bought a lamp. Do you want to buy twenty more lamps? And you're like, yeah. no, I'm okay. Yeah. And like. I can leave that now for it. And also, I find myself getting like too inspired by certain things. I'm like, I'm going to unfollow that because yeah. otherwise I'm just going to start to copy it. Yeah. And it's too much like in the forefront of yeah. your mind and thinking and process and stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Basically, if I, if I know the person, I won't unfollow them because it's like, I know That's them. That's very kind of you. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Lucky my friends listening. Um, but yeah, if it's just like someone I followed because at some point I thought, oh, that's a cool account. And I go on it now and I'm like, if I if I followed I would wouldn't follow this today if I came across it so just cut it off. But um, I have I do notice when you do that you get a bit of a drop engagement because obviously some people who were following you are then going to unfollow and because if they're only following you because you're following them again like, do you really want those people following like for you? like exactly That's like some real uh, I guess uh, also the thing that Instagram does now is when you do follow someone, it will like really cram them down your throat for a few days and be yeah. like, here's all their pictures and posts and stories. Are you sure? Yeah, hey, you wanted it, <laughs> yeah. here it is. And it's just like, oh, that's intense. And then so sometimes I do it and then I think like, oh, actually, maybe that's a bit much. Yeah. <laughs> is there anyone from uh, the Fox or Simpsons world ever like commented on, on any of your stuff or anything like that? No, they haven't. A woman who uh, works at Fox... I think, got in touch with me and they, she was like, oh, your stuff's so brilliant, blah, blah, blah. And she sent me a whole bunch of stuff, like Simpsons oh, cool. merch. Oh, cool. And I was just like, I'm just going to take that as this is fine, right? Like, yeah, of course. This is fine. But like an endorsement. Uh, no, not really other than that. But there was um, like a Nancy Cartwright. Uh, I don't think it was actually her. A lot of people said like it wasn't actually her, but she was like liking loads of other Simpson people's stuff. Maybe it was her. I don't know. Yeah, Nancy Cartwright commented on one of my friend's images, actually. Was it really her? I, I it's mean, a blue tick is what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, wow. I don't know. Yeah, if anyone's going to have it, because you know when you find those accounts that have got like 2,000 followers and they've got a blue tick and you're like, who are you? Yeah. Who are you? Who do you know? Who have you paid? Oh, God. And can I have their details? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't want that. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? That blue, that blue tick. I like I'd like to say I don't care about the blue tick, but if we did all of a sudden get one, I would be like, oh yeah, you got a blue tick. Yeah, I think I'd be stoked. If you've got, there's certain like categories that it's really easy to get one. Like if you've written a book, it's easy to get one. If you're in a film or TV, it's easy to get one. It's like a media personality in some oh, way. Oh yeah, big time. I th yeah, definitely like presenters and like all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I definitely just don't fall into that category. Um, yet. Well, yet. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I would love one. I make no secret about that. But not in like any other way than like I like the way it looks. It's like a video game, like collecting like badges or whatever. Yeah, like yeah. I want the little thing. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose it's status, isn't it? It's... Kind of. I don't even like care. I just like think it looks nice. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. You can do what some people do and just like Photoshop one onto your profile picture. Do people do that? Yeah, you're not seeing that. No. So people just get the blue badge and just Photoshop it over their image. So it, it kind looks like of looks like it. it, yeah. It's sort of there. Yeah. Oh, no, that's really <laughs> yeah. sad. so bad. No, I'm not that's doing so that. so bad. That's like wearing counterfeit goods, isn't it? Yeah. I, I didn't know that. that was even a thing. Yeah, it happens, I've, yeah, quite a lot. It's so funny. Like I sent, we had, I think in our inbox recently, we had like six in a row blue ticks of just people that we were back and forthing with. So I I knew it, that my sister would just like really buzz off of that, so I I screen grabbed it and sent it to my sister, and she was just like, "Oh, you're famous now that like you're talking to all these people with blue ticks." And I wrote back, I was like, "They're doesn't all mean, just people. It means fuck all." It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. I don't. I yeah, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, it's not saying this person's better. It's just saying this person's probably got loads of fake accounts made around them, and 
Well, that's that's what someone said to me was like that's it's obviously there to it's a verified badge and yeah. so it's there to verify that you are who you say you are and it's like well no one's trying to be <laughs> me so yeah. I can't unless there's like a weird spammy account where they're like posting with the Simpsons crap <laughs> like it's not gonna happen. You should make make one for yourself. And just people do that, oh, don't that's they? From, oh my god! And I, they make yeah, fan accounts and stuff. It's super weird. It's new lows. Yeah. I'm fine without it. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> would you say that you're a perfectionist? No, I don't think I would. No. no. I your don't... stuff is so beautiful. Thank you. I think I wouldn't get anything done if I was like constantly... I'd really like my work to be neat and clean and I take a lot of care over it and I really care about how it looks. But I don't know what, I don't know what perfect means. So you're good at getting to the stage where you're like, this is done? Yeah, because okay. people want their signs. <laughs> like, yes. If it's for a job or whatever, it has to go out. And so there's kind of a, it's maybe good to have a cut-off thing. If I'm making stuff myself, I will go back and, like, change stuff or, t- like, remove it or put it back on or, like, and kind of fiddle with it. But then it gets to a point sometimes where you're doing more harm than good mm. and you're kind of maybe messing it up a little bit. Sometimes you just have to kind of stop. Yeah, because I imagine with a lot of what you do, you've kind of got, like, one shot to excuse the yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of sound yeah. kind of jokes oh there. my god this show was brought to you by <laughs> <laughs> um yes sometimes within reason if you are doing something that is got loads of different processes or different layers and you're building up paint or gold mm-hmm. or whatever it might be it gets harder and harder to go back a step but if you've just put on, you started painting the outer line or something and you do something a bit wonky or whatever, you can just remove that and then put it back on. Okay. Um, it's not like that's it, you know. Yeah. Um, but, it, yeah, sometimes you'd, I definitely have, like, got to the end of something and then tried to be like, oh, I'll just change that and then, like, absolutely ruined it or whatever. I don't know. Have you always been obsessed with, like, typography? No, I don't think so. I went, when I was at... Um, when I was doing like my A levels and stuff, I was doing like oil paintings and stuff like still lifes, and then um, kind of did loads of that stuff. And I thought I wanted to be a painter. And then when I went and did my foundation, um, you obviously try out loads of everything. You try a bit of everything because maybe during your A levels or your GCSEs, you don't. You kind of just do whatever you like, mm. and you kind of get forced to do loads of different things. And so I did all kinds of different things. And then I kind of did. Um, some more like graphic design lettering type stuff and like that's the first time that I was like oh that's really interesting I want to do more of that um so it was quite late on I think but definitely growing up in our house we had loads of cool old I mean (laughs) it took me ages to realize this but we had loads of cool old pub signs in our house and like amazing bits of lettering and like um cool bits of like old print design for like packaging and stuff like that and uh just really obviously that's like <laughs> my whole job now it's crazy isn't it so like subliminally i did it honestly only clicked like two years ago or something and i was just like oh right yeah and then like like don't live with my parents so i go around to my parents and i'm just mm. like oh i want that and i want that and i want all of those things in my house because that's the stuff i'm like on ebay trying to buy now because it's gorgeous but yeah obviously it really did have an impact yeah, that stuff when you when you're growing up that just becomes it's part of the furniture. You take it for granted, yeah. yeah. You like you don't care. Like you're running around doing whatever. Um yeah, and that's like like the stuff I'm trying to make now, you know? Yeah. So the um so like specifically Victorian kind of sign writing, I guess, would that have been your initial inspiration? Yeah. So I was doing a project at uni and it was about the Um, We had to take a chunk of text and um, reinterpret it in a relevant way to what the text is. And I would chose like um, this H.G. Wells book. And so what what course is this? This was um, graphic design and typography at LCC. And this was one of my final year projects. It wasn't even like in my first year, I was like, Mm. ooh, sign painting. It was literally like in the last four months of my whole degree. So that's like a segment of, of it was focusing on graphic design and typography. 
you, the whole, the whole, um, I think the first year you kind of did a bit of everything and then you kind of like went into a pathway in the second two years. And so, so I didn't it, do any A-levels, so I'm clueless about all this stuff. D- did you go to a university? Uh, yeah, no. okay. I didn't do a foundation. Oh, okay. I, I literally just, yeah, I skipped. I didn't, yeah, I haven't got any A-levels and I haven't got a foundation, but I managed to lag my way into a uni oh, nice. by showing them pictures of paintings on walls. Yeah, my own. you're like uh, this is Picasso. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Although, <laughs> although when I was uh, when I was tattooing, um, one like a guy who I knew was like, "I'll give you my portfolio." He was like, "Take oh it God, around to, to different in? to different studios." <gasps> he was like, "They'll give you a job." He was like, "After a week, they'll realize and they'll fire you, but it will give you enough experience." I was like, "Dude, you are absolutely brutal." I was like, so basically like, and he was like, "You need skin." He was like, "You've got to get in the door any way that you can." Yeah, and I was like, "Wow." <laughs> That's kind of messed up. Yeah, very insane. Yeah. But anyway. Anyway. Back to you. Um, no, so that project I did was at the end of my degree. So obviously I did my A-levels and then I did my uh, foundation year at Wimbledon. And then from there I went to LCC and that's where I did my degree. Um, and then, yeah, in, the, in my final year at my degree, you do three or four like major projects. Oh, I see. Okay. And one of those projects was to take this um, bunch of texts and then reinterpret it. And it was H.G. Wells book. So I was like looking into that whole era and and Victorian times and like what the lettering was like and the style of, which is obviously like really rich and amazing and ornate and beautiful. Um, And so I was like, oh, okay, well, I'll make a whole bunch of signs out of all these quotes from this book. And the book is um, The Island of Dr. Moreau, which is like a gnarly book about like vivisection and like monsters and like this crazy doctor. And so uh, I was making all of these... Uh, like ornate pretty signs of all these like really grotesque horrible lines and phrases from the book and stuff like that um and that was yeah that was that project and that's kind of how I learned about what sign painting was and kind of got interested in it um and then I left so I wasn't like doing all of those were screen printed onto glass because I was doing loads of screen printing there but um in terms of like what I do now it's not really the same thing but that's definitely where like the it started spark. yeah big time so as soon as you left what was your process then did you come out and think like, i'm going to go and become a designer somewhere i'm going to go straight into making signs no i don't think i really had like a career head on me mm. um when i was at uni i was just like this is great and it's like you're there to kind of experiment and play and meet people and do all of this stuff which you are but then i think like a lot of uni courses they don't really like prepare you for like this is how you get a job and this is how you do your tax return and here's how to be a person and pay your bills. There's none of that. And so I kind of did that and then I left uni and then I was a bit like, uh, like burnt out because I just used up like all my energy and all my ideas over three years. And I was just like, oh, I don't really know what to do with myself. So yeah, I was like working part time in an office and like just kind of making stuff for myself, like doing little bits of design work and stuff like that. Um, but this sign painting is something that I kept coming back to because I was like, oh, I really enjoyed it and you can like use your hands and it kind of took me away from the screen and stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, I started doing more of that and then I went to some classes at like an art shop and I met some sign painters and I got an apprenticeship with a guy and I worked with him for a bit and learned a lot from him, kind of like what you were saying, like you just need like someone to show you you just need to be in that environment and then you pick it up so quickly and it's like here are your brushes this is your paint this is how you use it this is how you hold the thing you know this is all of the things that you need to know and so I kind of learned that from him and then once I had enough to kind of be getting on with it I kind of was just doing that more and more at home and practicing and painting stuff and then just slowly now it's now and good and good for him for like give taking a chance on you yeah I think did you have to like talk him into it no, I think I showed him some stuff that I'd been doing at home and I was like, oh, look, yeah, like this is what I've been doing. Like, would you maybe be up for me coming, like tagging along basically Shadowing, and helping yeah. out? Yeah. And he was like, yeah, sure. Just turn up. He was a pretty rough and ready guy. He was great. And so he was just like, yeah, sure. And um, so I did. And so he's he's painting like commercial buildings and signs for shops and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, Pete Hardwick. He did like tons of stuff around here, like loads of like East London. Oh, uh, yeah, I think stuff. he did um, actually a lot on Cheshire Street, which is where our, our old gallery was. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, he was great. And yeah, just went along and did that. And, and so, how was really that like being thrown in at the deep end? Because, like, that's your, you'd be painting for people's actual real jobs. Like, yeah, 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 big time. Um, I guess he kind of, nothing was like a big deal. Nothing was like big or scary or mm. worrying or whatever. He was just like, 
could just do it, you know, like there was no like just anything that came up, he was just like, oh, it's all right, we'll just do this. Like, you know, could just tackle it and kind of was just, he was not prepared. And that's kind of what was great. Just like so unprepared for things that like, just overcome it. Like, it's <laughs> yeah. fine, whatever it, whatever might come up. Um, and I guess that was like a nice thing. Some people learn under like people who are incredible. Um, and I think there's very particular ways of doing things and like, oh, you shouldn't do it like this. You should do it like this. And with him, it was just like, Oh, you forgot your paint can. Here's just cut Coke can in half. Here you go. Just use that. And it was just like nice. It was a really nice way to learn for me, I think. What was your biggest takeaway from working with him, do you reckon? I guess, I think he was quite, um, it's obviously just really important that the client is happy at the end of it, you know? And so making sure, kind of going back to them at the end of it and going like, here you go, here's a thing. And they go, oh, that looks fantastic. Would you mind if you just maybe added like a bit of a shadow to that? Yeah, no problem. And just doing it as long as they're happy at the end of it. Like like with anything, right? Like I guess you guys, you want people to be happy with the job. You want to be happy with the job. You want repeat custom, all of that stuff. So I guess just being like personable and good at your job. <laughs> it's like a thing that everyone should yeah. be maybe, but um, being mindful of that, I think definitely. And was it there that you discovered your love for gold leaf? Yeah, definitely. I hadn't used it. I was just painting um, on like glass and wood and brick and all kinds of stuff. But we did, a, I think it was a florist window, um, and we did some gold leaf. And I was just like hooked from like the second we did it. And I was like, oh my God, just such cool alchemy like putting all this stuff together and then the outcome is always like so eye-catching and everyone loves it like they all think it looks fantastic all that stuff um so yeah that was kind of it that was sort of like oh okay I just like I'm gonna cut this like really thin part of sign painting and keep that for myself and then yeah. like I don't care about the rest of it because that's the thing when I look at your stuff it's like you've got your niche it's very specific and in the beginning I kind of like, I would do maybe paint a sign on wood or do other kind of like MDF and do mm. other stuff, other people. But I never enjoyed it nearly as much as like doing glass and gold work. Um, and so I kind of really put my foot down and hoped for the best and was just like, well, no, like I'm just going to do this. And so if people were emailing for other stuff, I was like, well, I'm really sorry. I only want to work on glass. Wow. Yeah, which like when I think when you start out or whatever and you you want all the work that can come your way or you, you know, you're just grateful for it. It f sometimes felt like foolish, but then now it's like, well, that's just a given. That's the only thing that I do. And people don't ask for anything else, mm. which is nice, I guess. Yes. Yeah, that's brave, especially in the beginning when you're trying to make rent and someone, oh, yeah. someone wants a wood sign and you're like, no, no, I think I did do it at the beginning, but then just more, I was just better at doing glass stuff. Yeah. Cause like it's, it's just a perfect surface. It's yeah. completely smooth all the time. And so it's just like, oh my God, you want me to paint on bricks? No, that's awful. <laughs> like it just like sucks up all the paint. It's really rough and ruins your brushes. And so, uh, yeah, I just spoiled myself. What would you do in a situation? Would you recommend them to someone else? Yeah, big time. Even now I do that. If somebody wants something that's perhaps not my style of work or they want something that I am not equipped to do or I don't have the space to do it or whatever it might be, I'm more than happy to be like, here's this great sign painter, mm. M maybe go and ask him. Or, oh, this girl is brilliant at doing those, go and talk to her. Like, absolutely. There's more than enough work to go around, I think. And, like, I want people, like, I want the person to be happy and I want... Instead of me struggling to do something that they're not happy with and I don't want to do, then why not? You know. And do you find you get recommendations from other people who do who aren't so good on glass stuff? And they yeah, kind of yeah, 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 big time. Yeah, I think so. Or if they want something, maybe if it's a more traditional sign painter and they do kind of like very ornate, maybe like muted palette kind of things, whatever, and the person wants something like bright pink or whatever it might be <laughs> then they'll send it my way and I'm like, yeah, brilliant. Like I'm more than happy. That's like the language that I speak. I'll do that as well. So good. And I, like, we've been talking about it quite a lot recently of, of like encouraging people, like don't just take it on with a scarcity mindset of like, oh shit, they've asked me for this thing. I better work out how to do it. If you know someone who can do it better, yeah. because like it's, it's more valuable for you in the long run to not take that commission and potentially fuck it up to just give it to your friend. Yeah. And like, it doesn't mean that like, they obviously approached you because they thought like they liked your work. Oh, shit, sorry. They liked your work and they um, are interested in working with you. And like, I would always appreciate someone being like, oh, go and ask this person. But you know, like 
if you ever want something like this, I'm here, I'm more than happy to do it. And mm. so they're not going to forget who you are. And also, if anything, they'd probably appreciate your honesty and approach you in the future because they're like, oh, that was cool, you know? Yeah. So what's your split between, like, uh, I guess, personal commissions where someone's getting you to do, like, a sign for a wedding or a gift or something like that and um, working with brands because you've done, like, brand collaborations as well, haven't you? Yeah, a little bit. Um, I guess it could, I don't know, in, like, a percentage term. I do, most of what I do is commission-based, but then sometimes a job will come up where it is, like, with a brand or something a bit more corporate or something like that, which um, for me, maybe only, that's only happened in like the past two years. Um, and it's something I kind of like had to get my head around because yeah. it was like, I have absolutely like kind of no, I, it's such a scale up in terms of like what might be required and the commitment of time. Um, obviously the budget and stuff is different. Um, but then, and also exposure and stuff like that. So it's like great to do those jobs and like anything creative, it kind of, if you can do those, it kind of allows you a bit more wiggle room in your other things or the personal things that you want to do. It, get, it buys you a bit more time. Um, I would say maybe it's like 80, 20, like private stuff for people, uh, like yeah, wedding signs or whatever. Um, and then some brandy stuff. How did you work out how to cost? It's really difficult. I still find it really, really hard. It is really hard. Um, I guess. I think so many creatives struggle with it because you you're have so in your grateful. Head, you're yeah. just like, oh my god, yeah, but yeah, I yeah. love my job. So why would I charge anyone for my time or materials or like my crumbling or this, spine? Or this food <laughs> that I yeah. have to eat. Yeah, or like the heating in my house or my mortgage <laughs> or whatever it is. Um, yeah, you're just so scared and grateful that like you don't maybe charge. I don't think I charge enough at all. Um, I guess you kind of weigh it up. A really great thing to do is like ask. I think now I'm much more confident, but in the beginning I was like, for like two years, I was like, why don't I have any money? What am I doing? And I was like buying all this gold and then being like, I don't have any money. I work every day. Yeah, I work really long hours, but my material costs are massive. And I'm like, just the thing that was missing was like, oh, right, I'm not charging fairly for like my time or materials or anything like that. Um, I guess it just comes with time and kind of you feel it out like other people in your field. So other sign painters that work similar jobs or we're working on a job together, you know, you'll talk about the budget and you'll talk about materials and costs and stuff like that. And you get more of a feel for what's realistic and what's fair. Um, but then saying that with brands, obviously they have generally like much bit, not always, but m like bigger budgets and they kind of, but then they're kind of paying for more stuff like posts on Instagram or exposure, or they're kind of buying into you as a person or, you know, they want some of your cool to be associated sure. with it. And so that comes like, how do you price that? Um, yeah, because it's I, weird. It's a weird I, one. I think a lot of brands will sort of expect they'll be like, you're going to, you're going to pop that on Instagram as well. Mm. And it's like, you have you to pay for that. You know you need to pay yeah. for that. Yeah, I guess when it's like a private commission and somebody wants to sign for their living room, I go, okay, well, design time, materials, painting time, you know, that much money. That's so easy for me to work out now. But then with that, it's something that I don't have an agent. I have a really lovely friend who acts as my agent, Sophie, thank you. Um, and if I ever need to go into a meeting with a brand or a company or whatever, I can bring her with me because she's really well versed in it and experienced and she can help me and she'll go, well, this and this and this and this will cost money. And like any creative person, I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't. And also it's so hard to ask for money, but you bring another third person into it and she'll just ask for money for me. And I'm like, yeah. oh, that's such a weight off. That's great. So I guess having another person there to kind of bounce it off and also to, ca like you're saying, like to catch it and go, oh, okay, well, yeah, it costs money to promote and to post. And like all my followers are like hard earned. And like if, yeah. if I'm going to like do an ad at them, like it needs to be worth it. Mm. I really hate like just really obvious like buying stuff. I don't know. I think I've been approached by people to do like ad stuff. And I'm just like my followers – don't care. I don't care. That's what not kind a of good thing, like, like posting a, a tea or something like that. Oh no, I'd love to post a tea. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, like uh, I don't know, like uh, hair straighteners, stuff like right. that. I'm just like, uh, I don't, I don't use them. Yeah. And like obviously, 
I'm mean, joking. I'm I mean, joking. Clearly. That's such a dick. <laughs> that's such a dick thing to say. Oh mate, I blow dried my hair this morning. Yeah, it looks I mean, lovely. You can't I was tell. just it being a dick. Like I was just being a dick. Um, just stuff like yeah, I don't know stuff that I don't use in my real life. I'm not gonna go around and be like, this is great. Yeah. yeah. But have you ever approached a brand that you want to work with? No, but if I like something and it's a real part of my life or whatever I'm not shy about it I don't make it a secret Mm. and so like the Bombay Sapphire job came about because (laughs) like I really brazenly was like I love gin (laughs) and like it wasn't a secret and so from that I got actually the I did a cover for stylist and it was like the gin issue and they got me to do this like really cool cover about gin and I was like yeah like Synergy, <laughs> uh, but then yeah, same with the one by Sapphire thing. I can't remember how they said it. It was like they said it was like a really authentic something. Just because I like like a gin and tonic, like everyone else. So for me, that made so much sense, and I put that on, on my Instagram, whatever. And people are like, yeah, that's really logical, you know. But then similarly, I think it is fine when people do that if it is if it suits them. And I see like I follow loads of influencers and stuff like that. And if they put up something, I go, oh yeah, that's like. That's them. Uh, yeah, like that really makes sense, and obviously somebody thought about that really well, and it's a really genuine pairing, and that's the way that you're going to get engagement with it. Not like it's so obvious if they're just like, "Here's the money, do a post about the X product or whatever." How does someone find a Sophie? <sighs> um, well, I don't know. You can't have mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I a lot of the like I said at uni, they don't necessarily teach you tons of stuff, but sometimes like I'm a creative and I'm friends with lots of creatives and so if I'm struggling to price something up or I've got a problem with something else um I will ask my friends I'll message a bunch of people and be like oh you know how do I do this tax thing or whatever it is um but with that she's a person who works in a like creative industry Mm -hmm. and is like does pitches and understands working with clients and stuff like that and so I can't remember what it was at first, but I was kind of like just asking her loads of advice. And she kind of said, do you want me to come to the meeting with you? And I was like, oh, that'd be so great. Thank you so much. Um, And she did. And, you know, it was like kind of nothing for her because she's fluent in that. But for me, I was just like, I don't think I said anything. I think I was like, hi. And then they were like talking about they just had a back and forth about like a lot of stuff I really didn't understand over the line, under the line. Do you know what those things are? No. No. I mean, we've been doing this for nine years it's in the same like, meetings as you, and I've never heard that before. <laughs> I think it's something about, like, um, where it's going to be seen, like, in print or on billboards or on packaging. I don't know. Literally have no idea. Anyway, so they were talking about that stuff, and I was just like, okay, and then it was over, and then I was like, okay, bye. And that was like... But then I suppose, like, now that we've grown, like, our project managers are the people who are in those meetings. So we're, yeah, we've done the same That's thing. It. We, we don't go to those I guess, meetings, really. I guess, like, just find someone who is like maybe slightly older than you or does it kind of for their job and see if you can ask them some questions or at least tell like get like five questions from them so if I do go into meeting or I'm having a back and forth with a client or a brand I can say what's your budget what's this where's it going to be used blah 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 yeah. and those yeah. are like the things that I like you need to be asking and at least with the brand then they go oh okay this isn't just like because I think sometimes some brands are just like oh, here, we'll pay you no money, here you go. And kind of if you come back and say like, oh, well, actually, X, Y, Z, you know, they can go, oh, maybe we need to treat them like an actual person yeah. and give them a contract and pay them their money and not sure. to, and, not and you have to, Nick, you know. You have to realise like that these, like asking what's your budget seems like such a scary question when yeah. you're first starting out. But you have to realise... Don't, don't, yeah. don't dance around it. You save yeah. so much time, just yeah. say it. And if they've got no money, then you're like, well, okay, is it a cool thing that I want to do? No, well, okay, maybe then I'm not the person for that job, you yeah. know. Because that's the thing, so many emails can go backwards and forwards and then they're like, oh, yeah, I've got any budget for it. And you're like, okay, well, I've wasted so much yeah. time in this time, conversation yeah. then. Lead, Whereas, lead with budget, yeah. yeah. I think if you, but especially if you are abandoned, they say like, don't be like, it will look good for you, which is like, I'll, I will decide that. Yeah, you don't need yeah. to tell me that. But um, if they say like, we don't have much money for it, but, you know, it might be really fun. I've done tons of jobs for little or no money because I really wanted to do them. Yeah. And it's not everything, you know, at the end of the day, you definitely need money to live. 
but sometimes it's really freeing and fun to kind of do something that isn't monetary or the exchange is something else like I will swap signs for tattoos or whatever it might be and it's kind of nice to remove the money element from it also there's a bit of pressure off because you're kind of less expected to like I don't know it's a bit more That's freeing because yeah, it's less deliver. of like a contract yeah, if you've been yeah, paid yeah. you have to deliver yeah precisely and you're kind of like oh it's scary this thing whereas if you're like oh I'll just do it you kind of do whatever you like and you're like well you're <laughs> not paying me so you know maybe we could try doing it this way or whatever and it's nice yeah, for sure. And these these brands and these people that you're speaking to, they hear this every single day. Mm. They're, they're, they're That's not the going to be. Thing. Yeah. They're so used to it and they're yeah. like, they don't care. Whereas I'll like, you know, have night terrors about like the email I have to send in the morning and I'm just like, oh, can I have a bit more money? And they're just like, yeah, fine. Yeah, sure. And you're like, oh, I should have asked for more. more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Down <laughs> for next time. But yeah, they're used to it, right? And I guess it's their job to get a good deal or save money or whatever. But then. If you can find a middle point where you're happy and they're happy, just leave it at that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and I think the middle point is always like higher on your end than you would expect. Oh, big time. Oh, big time. But then also, oh my God, they just must have loads of money, right? Yeah. I don't know. It depends who it is. It does it does depend who it is, but I always find it funny when when you're talking to a like a global brand. Mm. And they're like, oh, we haven't got much money for this. And it's like, well, <laughs> you, I, mean, it's I know to that you make more money than God. So you you can afford this if you do really want it. Yeah. Um, and it just, it just comes down to, do you want us to do this for you? Mm. If you really want us to do this for you, then you'll pay this much. If you just want it done by anyone, mm. then you can pay your lower amount. I think that is how precisely, I think you're exactly right. And I think... Um, that's where your leverage comes in because it's like, oh, you want me to yeah. do it. You're paying for like me, like to have my name to, and for me to promote it or say or whatever. Whereas like you could get anyone else to do that. Anybody can pay a sign, whatever. But like if you want to say it was me, I mean, that's the difference between like a Lacoste shirt and a Primark shirt, whatever. It's like that's the, the little thing that like you have and like don't forget that little bit. Yeah. It's like your little thing, you know? Yeah, your brand. Yeah. Yeah. And all of this um, for you started in your bedroom, right? Yeah, when I was, yes. So when I was um, kind of trying to figure out what I was doing and how to do it and where to do it, I was, like everything, like every, you just, everybody does it in their room, right? Everybody yeah, just like. they do. Yeah. This um, is why I'm asking the question is because it's just, there'll be a million people listening that are like, oh, it's okay that I've got like, paint pots sitting on my on my windowsill oh, and massively yeah. yeah it's not like I like left uni and then the next day moved into studio. my studio and now yeah. here's my job um I was do yeah I'm just painting in my bedroom I was living at my mum's in a little room in the attic um and uh, yeah I had my desk and like all my clothes were there and my bed was there and then that was it and I would just like paint signs all day and then kind of like roll into bed and then wake up in the morning and then just like paint signs all day and just did that for like two years um and I, I guess not all of those are going to be commissions because not a million commissions are coming in. So no, a lot of those no, no. Are, you're creating your own portfolio by just doing work. Just trying like. out stuff, working out like techniques, how I could do things. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely wasn't all um, commission based stuff. Um, but whereas it was really good to be very immersive, like in my studio and just working all the time, also quite unhealthy, loads of fumes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, mentally, absolutely no separation from it. And I was like, I got to the point where I was just like, what am I doing? Oh my God, I don't leave this room. And like, I just started to lose my mind a bit. It was making me a bit sad. And my mom was like, oh, okay, well, it seems like, you know, it's kind of going in the right direction. Have you thought about... Get the fuck out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, to stop ruining the floor in this room and maybe leaving to go and work somewhere else. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I don't know. And so I just, yeah, Googled it, um, went to go and look at some places, some little studios. Um, and, yeah, I eventually found a place. And when I went to go and look at it, I was like, oh, there was, like, a real, a real, like, amazing moment. And the studio was fantastic. I was there for, like, three years. And I absolutely loved it. I'd never had a studio before. All my stuff was there and I'd travel to it and I'd go and do my job and it felt like it was really my job. Um, that was amazing. And then I, it allowed me to take it all a bit more seriously and mm. really, really work really hard for it. And I just felt so grateful to have it that like, yeah, just really kept working. Yeah. What would you say to someone who doesn't think they can afford a studio? <sighs> They're really, really, really expensive, especially in London. It's really hard. Um 
my first studio was with a company called Akava, which stands for like artist, charity, something, visual, art, something. And they're, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, Akava. Sounds, sounds like a line from the Simpsons. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, Google it. Um, they are partly a charity and so they kind of buy up disused buildings or office spaces and stuff like that all over London, but also outside of London now, because obviously they recognise like everyone else, there is less opportunity, there's less empty buildings really. Um, and they carve them up into studios and they make it pretty affordable. I know a few people who are in them in different spaces. Um, they're pretty good. I guess that's a good place to start. There are a whole bunch of different kind of slightly charity based art studio places. The problem is because they are affordable, people get them and they don't leave. So I was the youngest person in that studio and everyone else was like definitely over 50. And like a lot of them, I would like, would go weeks without seeing people. Like people didn't really come in very often, which is like, yeah, it was kind of a crying shame. I think in, like it was maybe just cheaper than people having storage. And so yeah. they just would have all their stuff in it, which That's is like heartbreaking because there are so many people who are like desperate and would really make a go of it and would really like, you know, put yeah. it to good use. I feel like something like that, you almost need to put, something in place that stops that happening so you have to come in at least this amount I think of they a say month. that but then also like who's going to check I suppose nobody enforces it I was yeah. in the middle of an industrial estate in Perivale like n nobody was ever yeah. came there you know nobody ever checked it's really tricky I don't know like without that I don't know what I would have done and then now I moved to um, it's basically a big warehouse that's going to be bulldozed uh, in a couple of years and so we're in there but then after that I don't know mm -hmm. it's really hard Unless you're like really in the outskirts or I think a lot of people are literally just in disused warehouses and they kind of make the best of it and then you kind of have to move on. So it's yeah. a weird like squatting scenario, but also you definitely are still paying like hundreds of pounds of rent. Do you think that by moving into a studio improved your business? Oh my God, yes. 100%. Um, apart from like... I mean, I say it like gave me some like separation, mm -hmm. but it didn't because I definitely just like... <laughs> you just start sleeping in the studio. <laughs> well, like I'm just, yeah, you just spend long hours and it takes you longer to get home. Or like, I definitely, like I'm obsessed with my job and it's like all I think about. And so you go there and I work all day long and then I'll go home and just do emails all night or whatever. Yeah. But it did allow me to like, be like, I'm going to work now. Mm -hmm. And then you'd go there instead of like... I'm going to just paint in my pyjamas all day, which is like maybe, you know, you need to take it a bit more seriously than that. But I was limited because I was working in a small room before at my mum's. I couldn't, I was limited in the size of sign that I could do or, you know, the kind of materials I could use. Whereas in my studio, I was making much bigger signs and I could take on bigger commissions and I could store more stuff. And like, it was just like, yeah, everything about it kind of changed how I could work. Um, yeah, big time. I've got a friend who just sent out a text message to everyone that she knew saying I need a space to work from mm -hmm. and ended up getting a, a friend's garage, like a friend's dad's garage. Um, so it's it's being resourceful, isn't it? And finding, uh, I mean, she's able to use that work, that um, garage for free. Yeah. So, I mean, it's... It's really tricky. I think depending on what you do, if you are like a messy painter or you're a carpenter or whatever it might be, you kind of have to be open to, you know there probably isn't going to be heating there might not be fantastic light you kind of have to work with whatever you can find and get on with it and like you know buy some fan heaters or buy some uplights yeah, and like yeah. it's never going to be like this like stunning high ceiling thing yeah. unless you move to like the middle of nowhere or something where there are like way more affordable things i think a lot of people are moving out because it's just so much more appealing for like the money that you would spend to maybe have a small space here in london you could get so much more. Yeah, like a lot of people are moving to like Margate because there's okay. lots of cheap artist spaces. Oh, there. absolutely, yeah, precisely. Like, yeah, I know tons of people who have done that. Um, so yeah, it's an option. Like, I think I definitely, because I was like born and raised in London, I have this kind of like thing where I'm like, it's all happening here and you need to be here. And like, I really do love it here. And it, like, I love being near stuff and it is great for coming to meetings or whatever mm. it might be. Um, but realistically, I think maybe in a few years, I'm going to be like, this is really unsustainable and probably move a bit further out. And then like the dream would be to have a, you know, like a studio on some land in the middle of nowhere yeah. or something, just more space, you know, you put on your own shows. Yes. So when I graduated, uh, and I started sign painting and like Instagram wasn't like a big thing. 
I'm not, I had a Blackberry for ages. I'm not even sure I got my iPhone until quite late. So then I got Instagram and I was like, oh, great. But uh, before that, I was painting all these signs and I didn't... Like, when you were at uni, you'd have exhibitions all the time or you'd throw stuff up on the studio walls and be like, oh, everybody come and have a beer. Look at some stuff we've been working on. And so I kind of was like, how do I get people to see this stuff? And I was like, oh, just have a show, right? Like, we did at uni. And so I had... My first exhibition was in the one of the archways um, on the cut by Waterloo in this space it was amazing like huge brick walls really moody lighting and um yeah I just made a bunch of signs and I put them on the walls and then had a big party and bought tons of beer and then everybody came and like that was great um did you sell anything I did sell quite a few things yeah uh, and I was like oh you know that went amazingly well because I had no idea kind of how it would pan out and uh, did you get the space for did you manage to black the space for free it was somebody that I went to school with and so I got it for yeah really cheap um and it was all my shows only for one night, um, just because I think people come. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. a like you, it's now or never kind of thing, yeah. you know. And also, I don't want to be like there. I don't know. Just kind of do it, and then it's done, and yeah. then it's over, you know. Um, so yeah, did, I did, did that. Did you worry that no one would come? I know my friends would come because I bought loads of beer. <laughs> so there was like definitely some bodies were going to be in the room. Yeah. But I kind of put it up on the internet and all kinds of stuff. And so my uni friends came and like my close mates came and like a whole bunch of people did come. It was good. Yeah, that went really well. And so uh, I did that. And then I went and did loads of work and then it kind of built slowly. It's been a really like slow, gradual thing, you know. Um, and then two years later, I had another show. I did the same thing again, but this was in uh, Leonard Street, not far from here, mm -hmm. in the basement uh, of a place. And then that went really, really well. Loads of people came to that. And I was like, oh, that's great. And then I kind of had a year off. And then um, last year I had a show again. So Marvel. how long will you wait until you do another one? It'll be next year. Yeah. I think. I do it every, two, every years. two years. I don't know why I've uh, <laughs> imposed that on myself. But because what I do is like commission based all the time it's kind of nice to set aside a few months and just to like, you make all the signs you want to make and like they can say and say whatever you like, they can look however you like, you don't have to, you know, nobody's going to check it or sign off on it or give you yeah, feedback yeah. or anything like that. And so that's really nice for me, but I think it's kind of every two years seems like the right kind of time because it does take quite a lot out of you. Yeah. Um, it's quite a lot of hard work and it's quite a lot of money because you're just making loads of signs that are pretty like ott um and you don't have buyers for any of them or whatever um but yeah i did the last one nearly a month a uh, year ago in november last november do you have like a theme for the shows no it's just kind of whatever i like and yeah. because i get, like keep notes on my phone of like if i hear like a really good lyric or a phrase or like what a, one good word or like diff just color combinations or whatever that's just kind of like a long list on my phone and then so when I sit down to do my show I kind of plan out like 20 signs and I'm like just it's all these random sporadic things mm. that I've seen over like two years that I want to do and so there's no like maybe there should be a theme but no there hasn't been yet it's just kind of whatever I what's your favorite like. stuff to make I guess my own stuff but that might be like a combination of like certain types of like sm like I don't class myself as an illustrator at all but like sometimes it will have like smaller illustrative things or like something that I can spend a really long time designing and then go away and paint. That's what I really enjoy doing. But I don't always have loads of time. There's usually every sign comes with a pretty tight deadline. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of are limited in how long you can spend going back and forth on the design with the client. And then I've got a limited amount of time to make it and then they're going to come pick it up and then it's gone. So I don't always get as long as I would like to work on things. So if I do, if I am doing my own work and I can spend like a month maybe coming back and forth on something, like that's fantastic. You but, said how you don't refer to yourself as an illustrator. Um, one thing I've noticed about you as well is you will never refer to yourself as an artist. No, I think it's really weird. Yeah, have you got a problem with this? You're definitely an artist. I know. Um, I don't know. I think I just have this thing of like, if I'm standing in the pub and I meet someone's dad and he's like oh what do you do i'm never gonna be like i'm an artist are you fucking are mate <laughs> <laughs> but i think it just opens up so many other questions it's just me being like a weird and embarrassed what, what, what do you say i just say i'm a sign painter and they're just like all oh, right 
Or sometimes I say so you're like, trying to play it down. You're yeah, like, you don't definitely. Want the spotlight. On yeah, you. definitely. And then they'll see my stuff and be like, "Oh my god!" Like I don't know what they imagine I do, but I just yeah, play it down. Just just quite embarrassed for some reason. I have no idea why. Like yeah, I think my that? work's cool. I don't know, but sometimes I just go, "Oh, I'm a painter," and people think I'm like if I'm covered in my paint clothes and stuff, they'll be like uh, like a house. Like a yeah, like a, they're like, yeah. "Oh, painting living rooms and stuff." Oh, can, you, can you just try it for a month, just for I us? I might and just say like back. sign painter and artist. That's a compromise. All right. <laughs> That's what life's about. All right. Promise. <laughs> yeah, promise. Or you could say artistic sign painter. Oh god, that sounds awful. That's yeah. even more pretentious. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But oh, if, I guess if you go like artist, and they go, "What kind of artist?" And then I have to go, "Ah, oh, painter." It just leads back to the same thing, you know. It does, but I think I usually just give up and just get my Instagram up and go look like this. Yeah, don't I do talk this. That's fine, yeah. Well, yeah. It's yeah. just easier. Like, who wants to like describe a visual thing? Like, what do you guys say? I say artist a lot. Do you specify uh, what kind? Uh, I I say professional graffiti artist. That because oh that God, that's quite good. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that explains quite well. Oh well, that Someone explains it. Practice. That explains it quite quickly, and uh, and also it's not a job title that many people have heard, so it's in- instantly a conversation starter because they're like, oh, that's weird. Do you and like the conversation kind of, that follows? I mean, if they want to employ me, then yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, fine. That's the thing. It's like go into it with like almost a sales pitch. So if I meet someone now and they're like, what do you do? I'll basically have like a set thing that I'll probably say almost word for word every time. It might kind of vary a little bit. I'll be like, like, oh, well, I run a graffiti company. And then they're a bit like, what? Because that's always just a bit like a, what is that? That caught me, yeah. And then then it kind of allows you to go and and explain it of like, well, we do murals in kind of people's homes. We do bars, restaurants. I'll I'll always organise it in the way that what will be more relevant to them. Yeah. So if they work in the restaurant industry, I'll be like, oh, well, we paint lots of restaurants and bars. We also do things in people's homes. But if it's someone in like who owns a house that might want something, I'll be like, oh, well, we do people's homes, bars and restaurants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then kind of, it always starts small and then escalates. So I'll then go... We paint yachts. <laughs> yeah. I was like, we do all sorts of... So we have like, painted on a yacht before. Have you? Yeah, yeah. I've done a workshop on one owned of the by, biggest, yeah. the eighth biggest yacht in the world. <gasps> yeah, owned by one, someone high up at Microsoft, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's like one of the co-founders. Yeah. Was that nice for you guys? Oh, we, yeah, didn't, was, we didn't go, did I, we? I went to do the, oh, the recce for it. Yeah, I, I had two go. helicopter landing pads on it. Did you it get to was, go on a helicopter? No. No, there wasn't any on the boat at the time. Oh, right. Um, How disappointing. Yeah. Suck <laughs> shit. <laughs> Suck shit, mate. Um, amazing. What's the biggest boat you've been on? Oh, my God. Literally not. Like a ferry. A ferry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is, that's bigger. Yeah. Uh, no, that's amazing. Yeah, maybe I should um, be more honest about my job. Because yeah. yeah. anyone could become a potential client or might know someone. So as soon as you go into explaining everything fully, yeah. it's like that can lead to anything. Yeah. And because someone, someone would be like, oh, well, actually, I know someone who does this. And if they won't know that unless you tell them. Yeah. So so if I were you, I'd be like, oh, I'm a sign patron. I do these different kinds of things for these different kinds of people. I do kind of, sometimes I do say that. I'm not just like, I don't literally just like shut every conversation yeah, yeah. down. Sometimes I do obviously talk about it, but then also I think because I do do lots of different types of things. So I'm like, oh, I do like uh, paintings in restaurants or whatever. And then sometimes it's private person and stuff. And then sometimes it's just like my own artwork when I have an exhibition or sometimes mm. it's stuff for print and I do book covers and it's like, yeah, I, I'm not going to say every single one yeah. of those things like a fucking weird octopus. I always kind of say like towards the end of it is like basically any hard surface we can paint. <laughs> Look, just whatever you want, yeah. I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Anything, just please. Because we've done things like paint on pianos and That's suits it. of like, armour and yeah, all sorts of crazy anything. stuff. And then the lady on the bus is just like, please stop talking to me. <laughs> this yeah. is my stop. I need to go. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess that like you just don't say no to anything, right? So it's like, I guess if something weird does come along, you're like, sure. Like conversation is the is the method for all um, opportunity, mm. isn't it? And yeah. and I think you never you never ever know who you're talking to that who could help you later on in life. Big and time. it's like, yeah, yeah, and yeah. we all do so much because it's like we've we've got a tattoo studio. Maybe they're looking for a tattoo. Like we've got an advertising agency. Maybe they're looking to do some experiential experiential out of home. Like it, you never know who you're speaking to. So lead with something, but then and and don't just like then ramble about yourself. Like ask. <laughs> them questions and like have a conversation it's all about having a conversation but yeah. i just think if you if you go in on the back foot of like oh nothing important like don't worry I about it i literally do that and like yeah, mumble yeah. it into my pint i'm yeah. like oh, <laughs> oh, 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 who knows 
paint something. Yeah, something. He's painting. <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm doing. Yes, uh, I think you're right. I well, should. I don't know. I, should, uh, I don't know. I can't put my finger on what it is that I'm always just like. I guess I'm not embarrassed of my job. I think my job's really cool, but like, and like I don't think like imposter syndrome's a thing. Like I'm not. I'm. It's not like body snatchers. I'm definitely me, and I definitely do my job, and yeah. I'm definitely like I'm good at my job, but like. Yes. I don't know, like the Simpsons thing, like I'm not gonna be like I paint the Simpsons and put gold on them. I don't know, I don't know. I think that's a great conversation isn't it? <laughs> To some people I would yeah. say that definitely. But like What do you do? Well, have you heard of the Simpsons? <laughs> yeah. Have you heard of a little show called <laughs> The Simpsons? <laughs> well you're about to hear all about it. Yeah, I guess it depends. I th- in my head, this imaginary shy conversation I'm having is with like an older person. But then, even when I right. say that, they're like, "Oh yeah, my dad was a sign painter." So like, it's always really interesting. Like, yeah. so many people that I say that to, like the woman in my tanning salon, yes. Um, she, uh, like I just went to Ibiza and had like a little pop up show there, and um, I was like going on the sunbed because I was going to Ibiza, very pale. And she was like, oh, you know, what are you going for? I was like, oh, you know, like, I'm a painter. And she's like, oh, what kind of thing? I was like, oh, you know, I do a lot of gold, gold leaf work. And she's like, oh, yeah, my granddad was a gilder. And I was just like, oh, my God, amazing. So, like, I think it's more common than I think and people are more adept at understanding than I yeah. give them credit for. How did the Ibiza thing come about? Um, so I, it was uh, with Pikes, the hotel, and they um, – commissioned some like the hotel's got all kinds of like mad stuff all over the walls and like props and all kinds of crazy stuff and they saw a couple of people who worked for them got some signs commissioned for themselves and then they I think suggested me to the owners and they were like yeah they're great let's get a couple of signs made and so they did and they're hanging there and then um they wanted to do kind of like a pop-up like creative women London experience thing over a couple of days then so they got um a whole bunch of my friends who work in a tattoo shop uh, in Hackney, Femme Fatale Girls, so uh, Grace Neutral and Emily, um, they went over there and they were doing like a pop-up tattoo thing and doing tattoo with the people. And then I went over there and I made like maybe 15 little signs and kind of had them and put them up. And also Tessa Metcalf came and she bought a whole bunch of her jewellery. And then so we were kind of all there and just had like the run of this hotel for a couple of days. Super uh, cool. It was really, really fun. I've never really been on like a work holiday thing. They're the best. It was really, really, really fun. It was um, really cool to do it and really cool to be with all of those people as well, all of those women, um, because they're wild. (laughs) It was really, really good. Yeah. That's nice. Who's your favourite Simpsons character? (sighs) Oh, my God. I mean, like, just for like, I don't know, Homer, let's say that's really easy. But then sometimes they'll be like, I'll go through periods and I'm just like, oh, that person is like choice. Like Principal Skinner, I think, has got some really good lines and like a really good backstory. Yeah. And like his relationship with his mom is super weird. Yeah. It's like, I think that's like got really good depth in his character. And then like sometimes Mr. Burns, like the same thing. Uh, I don't know. See, for, I think Smithers is so much more, has so many more layers than Mr. Burns. <sighs> He definitely does. Also, their dynamic. Yeah. Like, yeah, there's so yeah. much more than just, like, the family. And I think, like, loads of people just be like, oh, ha-ha, Homer, or whatever. And it's like, oh, no, all those weird side characters and their interactions. Yeah. Like, Homer's uh, half-brother, Herb, like, the two episodes of him in are, like, just so good. Also, Danny DeVito, so good. <laughs> yeah. And it seems like uh, Patty and Selma are starting to have their... <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know why... But, like, kind of, like, I guess because they're, like, kind of miserable bitches. <laughs> like, people are, like, yes, I love that about them. They're just kind of, like, horrible but, like, really sassy and, like, they kind of give a fuck. But, yeah, weirdly, they've become very popular in, like, marketing terms. I don't know why. That's a weird thing. But, yes, they're brilliant. I love them. So for anyone who is... Um starting out their career like what's your key piece of advice to someone just starting out um what do you think it is that holds like most creative people back those are two separate questions i think but maybe they're kind of the same thing i think um in the beginning it can be hard because maybe you don't have any clients or customers so you need to start making work for people to see so that they can employ you. Otherwise, it's like you kind of need to take the first step so that people can, you're kind of in the eye line. 
Um, so make some work that you think is interesting and enjoyable and then not only will that keep you going when there is nothing else to do or you feel a bit like maybe what am I doing in my life um, but then other people can see it and also your passion and interest is so um, easily observed if it's genuine in your work people will be like oh that person's really excited about that and then they in turn are excited and want to employ you and then buy into it so that's one thing I guess just make work that interests you um, when if there's nothing else going on and then other people will be interested if you genuinely are it's like so obvious um, I guess that's the thing that can hold people back is worrying about what other people want to see or making work for Instagram and it's like uh, I mean that's not a brilliant way to go about it because you're it's not going to be genuine or interesting and you're kind of just like making whatever you're not there's no backstory to it or anything like that. So I guess try not to pander to what you think people want to see. Show them what, you know, what they never knew they wanted kind of thing. Like do whatever you like and then they'll be interested. That's amazing Great advice. Answer. Yeah, really, really good. Um, where can people find you online? Uh, on my Instagram at Alex May Hughes or on my appalling website, <laughs> alexmayhughes.co.uk. Why is your website so bad? It is a Tumblr. Um it's just like I made it when I left uni and it's basically just a continuous scroll of everything that I make. It's just basically like one big long block. Nothing's like um, sectioned up or it's not particularly easy to find any. So no about me page or anything? There like is that. an about me page where it's just like... A lot of shop? Well, no, not a shop. No, How sorry, people everybody. people buy something? Email me. Yeah. Don't DM me. <laughs> everybody does that I used to have it written on my Instagram but absolutely nobody paid attention to it so I took it off and people still do it but I just say like please email me there's too many platforms I can't like don't I can't like WhatsApp and my email and Instagram and then people weirdly Facebook messaging me and then just oh. like so many things I'm just like I can't possibly monitor six different things like I don't nobody works for me I, don't, I have to do my own emails and stuff like that and so like everybody i just direct them to my hotmail account <laughs> yeah <laughs> we really covered a lot of bases like msn and hotmail really showing my age and tumblr and tumblr yeah um so yeah just uh email me amazing cool. thanks so much thank, thank you, you.